Hello children of a lesser joint. I'm continuing now with part four of whether or not the lateral pterygoid muscle is involved with disc displacement. I had left off with this ending slide from Murray's 2001 article. I think it's important for the doctors in this group to read some of the literature that I've given in my bibliography for this grouping of videos. Murray in 2001 spends a lot of time talking about popular beliefs that have led to the thoughts that the lateral pterygoids might be involved in disc displacement. And I think, I think that you should take the time and read some of these articles because it does give us a different perspective on what we think. Secondly, as I'm transitioning over here, Murray is mostly talking about the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid in the beginning of this, but, but there is a superior head component to this article uh, and, and articles that are beyond 2001, which extend all the way up to 2007 in some areas. And they talk about what it was thought that the superior head of the lateral pterygoid did in maintaining a mild state of contraction that can pull the discs slightly anterior and, and medial and cause that disc displacement. And here are some of the authors below that that have espoused that particular rationale as, as part of their thoughts. In total, when I take a look at all the studies on both the inferior head and the superior head, there were some interesting findings that I'd like to bring to your attention. Number one is that the lateral pterygoid does not have a true reciprocal function in the strict sense of the anatomy as well as the physiology that this particular muscle complex is actually functioning as one muscle. However, there is a departure from that, and I think it's important because many of you have not been exposed to this before, and it certainly hasn't been incorporated into mainstream dentistry and muscle function, in that the muscles or the portions of the muscles are what are termed functionally heterogeneous. In other words, parts of the muscle function at different times, either independently or together, depending upon which muscle groupings you're looking at. And in some cases, they're even functionally partitioned. So they may have strict specificity in certain muscle groups. And if you can understand that, most muscles are what's called task dependent. Based on what it is that you're doing, the task that you're looking to perform, the movement you're looking to go into, the type of food that you have in your mouth, whether or not it's hard or whether or not it's soft, whether or not you're talking on the cell phone, whether or not you're taking a sip of fluid, your body and your muscles have to be able to meet the functional demands of what it is you're doing, not only to get the task done, but to make sure if you're doing multiple things at the same time, you don't choke. So... So we're pretty remarkable organism in, in that respect. In getting back to the lateral pterygoid muscle, in total, it functions to move the jaw in forward horizontal directions. And not only does it provide some force in doing this, it also provides what we call a discriminative task. It's involved in fine motor control. And those are precise movements, and that belongs to a different part of our physiologic system. 
And I'll get back to that in, in later lectures, but it's an important thing for the doctors to keep in the back of their minds. Fanachet's study in 2003 which is a continuation of the collaborative effort of all these authors, points out that they're no longer in agreement with the reciprocal function of the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle. That's an important finding. Additional finding, which I think you should be interested in, is the fact that the muscle is not active at postural rest. So when your lips are apart, separated, and you're just hanging out, the inferior head is not active. So there's no way you can maintain a force, or if they're not reciprocal in function truly, and the superior head is part of that, it's not going to pull the disc forward. So the present findings suggest that in the function of the superior head of the lateral pterygoid, whether or not there's going to be an antagonistic force to the forward movements, not the postural position, but the forward movements, depends on what you're doing. So everything becomes shaded to the concept of task dependence. I think... When we take a look at the study done in 2003 and 2004, they have 18 subjects in this group. And when you take a look at how they broke the study up, and that's why it's important to do the reading, because I'm just giving you my impression of the synopsis. You will see other things as well as I did. Uh, but for practicality purposes, um, I'm presenting the facts that I thought were most important, and you find out that in different portions of the muscle, not everybody that was tested actually tests the same in different portions of the muscle where the electrode was inserted. And if I take a closer look at this, you find out that mostly the superior head is functioning in the forward movement area. On jaw closing, maybe a third of the subjects are actually responding in, in different portions, with most of them responding in the lateral portion of the superior head of the medial of the lateral pterygoid. The lateral portion is that part closest to the outside of your face. But it also functions in a portion of the patient group tested in retrusive movements, as, as well as in clenching and intercuspal position. And I think that this was a finding that the group uh, found was unexpected. So they couldn't close the entire door on whether or not the superior head of the lateral pterygoid could actually contribute to this. Let me just get to the next slide. So my takeaway from, from this whole thing in, in conveying information to you is that different parts of the muscle function differently for different people and different movements and tasks. There was little activity of some of the portions of the superior head of the lateral pterygoid during closings. In other words, different parts of the muscle didn't always generate responses. I think it's also crucial that I bring up that they did test in these studies for single motor units. So they have a substantial amount of information which was not gathered before. And that's why these particular studies I hold in such high regard. And in, in continuing with some of the aspects of this, this is the next slide, but I'd like to read 
to you, and I don't usually like to read, so I'm going to look down and you'll excuse me, but this is the only article in almost 17,000 articles that I've collected that has three iconic co critical commentaries at the end of the article. One of them is by Sue Herring. Sue Herring is at the University of Washington, uh, the Department of Orthodontics, and she is an outstanding researcher. Um, we also see her collaborating often with uh, Betty Sindelar out of that same program, who I understand is now deceased. But this is what she said. That she says that these studies are elegant. And she calls this group dragon slayers in having armed us with superior information. The only dragon that remains alive is the one related to the findings of the superior head of the lateral pterygoid and when it is active. I think at this point, because so much is said here by these three iconic authors, the other two being Ann McMillan, uh, who you usually see writing with Alan Hannum, uh, or, or Moeller, who you usually find uh, with, with Bakke out of Copenhagen. Take a look. Form your own opinions. No study is perfect. However, I think that this provides us with really valuable information. So, I'm going to terminate here. I'm going to leave you with this last slide up here. So I have a point to transition. Thanks for being with me today. And I hope that we really come together and continue to rock it out with Jaw Talk. See you the next time.